so it is that David Copperfield comes into existence. What does it mean when we talk about David Copperfield? And especially, what does it mean to talk about the first monthly installment? February 3rd, 1849. My dear Henry, I am revolving a new work. February 27th, 1849. My dear Miss Coots, in the first agonies of a new book. What these two letters show is that Dickens is in the thrall of a new work shortly before May of 1849. What I want now to turn to is what it actually looks like when that first installment comes out. You see, when Dickens published his novel, it didn't appear, as you have it, this nice, fat, satisfying Penguin classic. No, instead, people would wait eagerly once a month, or sometimes once a week, but in this case, once a month, for a monthly installment. In this case, of David Copperfield. It came, wrapped in beautiful green wrappers, with an illustration in the front. The title, and several pages of advertisements. And then, contrary to the way in which you have your edition, you got both illustrations right away, and they would help mediate the way you read what followed. But then, turn the page, and the magic happened. Whether I shall turn out to be the hero of my own life, or whether that station will be held by anybody else, these pages must show. In the time that I have with you, I want to talk about two major divides that I see in the novel. That between past and present, and also tragedy and comedy. And what I want to argue is that in this novel, they're never so clearly divided. I want to do it specifically through David Copperfield's friends. You'll recall he gets to London, he's a little famished, he picks up some breakfast. An egg and a lovely piece of Ricky Bacon. Accordingly, we looked in at the baker's window, and after I had made a series of proposals to buy everything that was Ilias in the shop. He had rejected them one by one. We decided in favor of a nice little loaf of brown bread, which cost me threepence. Then, at a grocer's shop, we bought an egg and a slice of streaky bacon, which still left what I thought a good deal of change out of the second of the bright children's and made me consider London a very cheap place. So why is this bacon interesting? Because it's not the first time Streaky Bacon has shown up in Dickens' works. Oliver Twist, Chapter 17. It is the custom on the stage in all good murderous melodramas to present the tragic and the comic scenes in as regular alternation as the layers of red and white and a side of streaky bacon. So with this in mind, I want to look now at two different Copperfields. You'll notice that we're moving between time quite frequently, especially in these early chapters, as the older Copperfield remembers what it was like to be young Copperfield. And he looks back at the past, and very often he conjures the past before him. So you can almost picture the older author at the desk, remembering, and letting his mind wander and the fancy lies. I want to look at how he does this over a chapter break, the end of chapter one. No, I lay in my basket and my mother lay in her bed, but Betsy taught what Copperfield was forever in the land of dreams and shadows, the tremendous region whence I had to lately travel, and the light upon the window of our room shone out upon the earthly born of all such travelers, in the mound above the ashes, and the dust that once was he without whom I had never been. So that's the end of chapter one. Notice all the past tense verbs. This is in the past, right? This is Child Copperfield in Child Copperfield's time. Chapter 2, I observe. The first objects that assume a distinct presence before me, as I look far back into the blank of my infancy, are my mother with her pretty hair in youthful shape, and Peggotty with no shape at all, and eyes so dark that they 
it seemed to darken their whole neighborhood in her face, and cheeks and arms so hard and red that I wondered if the birds didn't peck her in preference to apples. I want to invite you to find other opportunities to see the moments that this tension occurs, where the older Copperfield that's writing this novel remembers and kind of slips into the past simultaneously. It's extraordinarily artful, and it's one of the rare instances of in the Victorian novel of writing, of watching somebody write from a child's perspective. The other instance that I want to look at deals more directly with this idea of the tragic and the comic. So I want to look at two instances where we see the child, the child Copperfield's naivete. Naivete is innocence. It's also called like, if somebody is naive. And remember, we have the older Copperfield writing about the younger Copperfield, and so he knows more. And yet, he'll often give us the impression only of what the childhood Copperfield sees. So the two instances that I want to look at have to do with the beating of his mother by Murdstone, which is a very subtle detail, and then also the comic scene where the waiter takes advantage of him. So let's begin. If I could have seen my mother alone, I should have gone down on my knees to her and besought her forgiveness. But I saw no one, Miss Murdstone accepted, during the whole time, except at evening prayers in the parlor, to which I was escorted by Miss Murdstone after everybody else was placed, where I was stationed, a young outlaw, all alone by myself near the door, and whence I was solemnly conducted by my jailer, before anyone arose from the devotional posture. I only observed that my mother was as far off from me as she could be, and kept her face another way so that I never saw it, and that Mr. Murdstone's hand was bound up in a large linen wrapper. It's a subtle point, but it's an interesting way in which we can see how Dickens simultaneously protects us from what's happened and lets us then not get caught up in certain of the tensions, but also that if you're reading closely, you can see just how traumatic a lot of this was on young Copperfield. The reason his mother stays away is because Murdstone has followed through on his threat and has beaten her. But the chapter ends, the moment ends, with the large bandage on Murdstone's hand and the revenge of Copperfield. This idea that we're moving very quickly between what the child recognizes as a, an important detail but maybe doesn't comprehend. So the elder Copperfield doesn't give us the details of what's happened. We have to infer them. At other moments, though, the elder Copperfield can't help but comment on his younger self's naivete, even though, of course, it's the elder Copperfield that's writing that moment. So it's a really exciting tension between those two moments. So we're going to now turn to the comic waiter. I replied that he would much oblige me by drinking it, if he thought he could do it safely, but by no means otherwise. When he did throw his head back and take it off quick, I had a horrible fear, I confess, of seeing him meet the fate of the lamented Mr. Topsawyer and fall lifeless on the carpet. But it didn't hurt him. On the contrary, I thought he seemed the fresher for it. This, though, is a case where Dickens, or the elder Copperfield, can't help but intervene. And so, after the whole scene, he gives us a little bit of an uh, indication that he knows something's been going on. If I had any doubt of him, I suppose this half awakened it. But I am inclined to believe that with the simple confidence of a child and the natural reliance of a child upon superior years, qualities I am very sorry any children should prematurely change for worldly wisdom, I had no serious mistrust of him on the whole, even then. Well, I hope you're enjoying David Copperfield so far, and I hope that you continue to revel in Dickens at the level of the sentence, but also in this amazing strategy of alternating the author and the subject. Enjoy it all. You are going to have an amazing year ahead of you. And thank you for watching this video. All the best. May you become truly Dickensian.